everyone. My name is Anita Varma, and I lead the Solidarity Journalism Initiative at UT Austin. I am so grateful to all of you, and particularly to our panelists, for being here today to discuss uh, a really important global solidarity movement that has begun in Iran and is catching worldwide media attention. Uh, I'm really pleased to be joined by all of you today. And for those of you who have not joined us for a Solidarity Journalism event before, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a framework and grounding for what's about to happen. So one thing that I talk about in the Solidarity Journalism Initiative is the importance of journalists being willing to pass the mic. We cannot be experts on everything. And there are times when it is absolutely crucial that we step aside and allow the people who know to speak up and be heard uh, more than maybe the rest of us. So that will be the format for today. I'm very pleased to pass the mic to three people who have thought deeply about the issues that are coming up right now, uh, both for the country and for questions of, of empowerment, of solidarity and of justice. Uh, I want to be clear that, of course, no one can claim to or really should attempt to speak for all members of a community or all members of a country. Uh, that is not what we're trying to do here. And we encourage constructive debate, of course. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're hearing each other out. So I truly understand that there are strong feelings and strong convictions on a lot of the issues we'll be discussing today. I do ask that everyone keep their comments and their questions respectful, uh, keeping in mind that we all come from our own experiences and uh, that will shape our perspectives. So again, thank you so much for being here. I think this is truly a, a crucial event and conversation that we will just be beginning by the end of this hour, uh, but wanted to make sure that we have a chance to come together to discuss the solidarity implications of woman life freedom. So with that, I will offer some brief introductions and I will drop a lengthier bio of each panelist in the chat once I've done so. Let's see if I can do some spotlighting as this happens. All right. So first we have Sarah Shaban, who is a critical cultural scholar focused on the intersections between media, women's social movements, and geopolitics in the Middle East. She is the author of the book, Iranian Feminism and Transnational Ethics in Media Discourse. And she's worked in US local news, as well as freelance journalism abroad and in the nonprofit sector. Sarah is fueled by her passion for social justice. Then we have Tara Kangal, excuse me, Kangarlu, who is an award-winning American journalist. And you may have seen her work in news outlets such as CNN, Time, Al Jazeera America, to name just a few. She is the author of the book, The Heartbeat of Iran. Tara is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. And last but certainly not least, we have Afruz Mosaloui, who is a visual media expert based at Rutgers University. She looks at the intersection of visual and political communication with a focus on the representation of others in US media. And her current research examines how newsreaders perceive and interpret the incongruency between images and text in online news articles. So as I promised, I will drop our panelists full bios in the chat in just a moment. But while I'm doing that, I wanted to kick things off by asking Sarah to do some scene setting for us. So understanding that a lot of us involved in solidarity work uh, and especially US based solidarity work may not be familiar with what is happening in Iran. What does the hashtag woman life freedom and Masa Amini, what do these things mean? And what is the role of removing uh, the hijab in all of this? Sarah, if you could kick us off. Sure, thank you, Anita. Um, so first of all, I just want to preface with the fact that um, I am not Iranian. I think that that tends to be um, a misconception. So I just want to I want to say that, which is why I am so happy that um, Tara and Afruz were able to join us on this panel. 
Um, so what is happening in Iran? What's going on? So we're looking at day 37 of the protests across Iran, which were initially sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Jana Amina Amini on September 16th. And that was three days after Iran's morality of police had arrested her for bad hijab or not wearing hijab appropriately. And she was taken to what they would call a re-education facility for lessons in modesty. So what we're seeing right now is people from every gender, class, age, ideology are taking to the streets. And um, the, while the buildup to these protests are layered with social and economic concerns, there should be no mistake that this is a feminist revolution. And I say that because um, it's important to remember that these protests aren't about hijab or even about hair, it's about bodily autonomy for women. And, uh, and even the, this addressing this problematic reality of using a woman's body as a symbol for the state or to use another problematic term, the motherland. Um, now more of the world is privy to viewing the Iranian woman's body as a symbol of protest and freedom. So as far as, um, I think we maybe we've seen some, of, did we want to talk about the hair cutting videos or not yet? Okay, so there have been these videos and images circulating around the internet, particular social media um, of women removing hijab, burning hijab, um, cutting their hair. And depending if we're talking about women in Iran, the diaspora or non-Iranians who are claiming solidarity with, uh, with women in Iran will depend on what that would even mean. So uh, for Iranian women, cutting off, and not just for Iranian women, but for, in this case, cutting off their hair is a significant form of protest because it is, it can be considered a sign of beauty, which is prohibited from being displayed by the Islamic Republic. But it's also a symbol of mourning, which you can see throughout um, Iranian literature as well. And women in the diaspora are also cutting and shaving off their hair in Italy, in Belgium, in Germany. And there's actually a really a, a popular Instagram account that's growing um, in followership and following. It's called You've Got Mail Iran. And it invites people to support Iranian protesters by posting a solidarity video or a photo of you cutting and sending a lock of your hair to the UN mission of the Islamic Republic of Iran. But only the bottom locks of your hair to prevent potential DNA testing, which is done with the uh, hair roots. So these non-Iranian women, particularly French actresses who have made headlines, um, we're talking about Miriam Cotillard and Juliette Binoche. Um, I, I personally take a little bit of issue with that um, because yes, they're drawing attention to what's happening in Iran. And I would, I'm actually very curious to see, to hear what Tara and Afruz have to say about this um, as uh, women, uh, as Iranian women. But I struggle because it does seem performative on some kind of level, and it doesn't hold the same meaning as if an Iranian woman was doing the same thing. But, but like at the same time, I see that, you know, we're still, it's still drawing attention to what's going on. But I do think it's more powerful to see Iranian women and women in the diaspora um, doing those things and amplifying voices of women in Iran doing these things. And so if these women, these famous actresses, could use their platforms as a space for women in Iran to occupy rather than, you know, giving that giving more space for Iranian women's voices rather than their own. Um, and what's also problematic is France's history of legislation banning Muslim women from veiling or restricting head coverings. Um, but again, I, I, I'm very curious to, to hear what uh, Fruz and Tara would say about that um, for, for me to learn from. Thank you. Tara, would you like to offer your thoughts just as the scene setting of what is happening in Iran and what uh, we might understand of the hashtags that are gaining global traction? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. So good to be with you all. Um, uh, I just... Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about this, um, you know, journalism versus activism. That's something I, I very much want to talk about, especially uh, I assume we're speaking with um, some journalism students as well. But, you know, as, as, an, as an Iranian-American journalist and um, international correspondent, um, you know, what's going on in Iran is 
uh, you know, a reflection of um, an entire nation coming together, uh, united from different parts of the country, from different religious, ethnic backgrounds, sociopolitical classes, um, uh, uh, united against change. And, and I have to say that, um, you know, talking about this uh, bodily autonomy and so forth, I think um, this movement is not really about that, but rather about um, a, a nation, again, coming together, uh, asking for change, fundamental socio-political, economic, civil change, whether that has to do with um, women's rights, human rights, um, or uh, every single other uh, challenge that ordinary Iranians um, are facing and have faced in the last four decades in the face of the current regime. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Americans, uh, we, we, have a, we have a way to oversimplify and reduce things to, you know, very simple forms in order to have the masses understand, uh, you know, very complex issues. Uh, but, but, but there's a danger to that. And, you know, um, you know it's important to uh, take the opportunity to, to, take an in-depth look to what's happening in Iran for those who are interested in understanding, you know, the very many nuances and, and isms that um, are taking place in that country. But at the same time, I think, um, I don't think there, there is any Iranian uh, uh, out there, uh, whether in the diaspora or inside the country, who's not appreciating the world paying attention. So whether that attention is coming, you know, in a form of fellow French, German American women cutting their hair, or you know whatever other way uh, people are showing solidarity. Um, I, I know that Iranians, um, especially those in Iran and and you know those in the diaspora, uh, they're appreciating. So again, any form of attention to Iranian people and their voices is great. Um, however, there are dangers of reducing um, incredibly. Uh, profound, complex, and important movements um, into, you know, just oversimplified uh, definitions. Um, and, and again, happy to delve deep, deeper into the, the topic, but I think what's going on is also a reflection of how little the world knows about Iran and Iranian people and how, how much we've missed the last 40 years to talk about ordinary Iranians, to understand the complexities of the society, to understand the nuances and the many you know, layers of life in that country and have truly sufficed to understanding this nation of now 83 million uh, through the prism of politics. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's my, my initial take as we open the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Afruz, I wonder if you could comment on, you know, things that you would consider important as we enter this conversation for folks who are not necessarily super familiar, and especially with that image you showed us on your wall, I wonder if you could speak to the role of imagery and what that, um, what that image signifies. Um, sure, thank you, and um, hello to everyone. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I would like to add to what Sara and Tara uh, mentioned earlier that um, this is a intersectional movement. We have people from all socioeconomic, um, ethnicity, um, and um, just age um, coming together and asking for some fundamental change. We should not forget that uh, Mahsa was a Kurdish girl uh, coming from a Kurdish small town named Saqiz on the west of Iran, and that um, that ethnicity uh, was a big part of her identity. And as we know, um, ethnicity, different ethnicities in Iran are um, small minorities going through a lot of um, oppression and violence for the past decades. And um, the main chant of these movements, uh, which has been translated into woman life freedom in Farsi, actually originates from the Kurdish version of that, uh, first appeared in 1980s in um, Kurdish um, freedom movement, Jenjian um, Azadi. And um, that is uh, what is just moving all these movements um, ahead. Um, and uh, I would just like to leave a comment on what um, Sara said about cutting hairs. I had heard um, similar comments from uh, my friends who um, study gender um, and their work has to do with 
um, feminism in general that they have read some problematic um, interpretations from what non-Iranian women um, all around the world were doing. But as Tara mentioned, I would like to say what Iranian people inside Iran um, took from what was happening. They were seeking media attention and um, this act happening all over the world made them to get the media attention. And I think that was the first thing that people wanted in Iran because usually because of the censorship and filtering and the crippled media um, um, system in Iran, not much news um, travels outside Iran. And um, specifically in the case of these, this, these protests and also the previous protests back in 2019, where we had um, huge internet shutdown and we were not able to get any news from Iran. Um, so this really um, got that media attention that everyone uh, were looking for. And also commenting on the visuality, um, these protests are extremely visual in nature because um, hijab is actually considered the um, just the manifestation of um, this religious um, dictatorship. And by putting it on fire, by removing it, by putting it into bonfires or putting on the stick um, in an act of um, objection uh, has made it all physical and tangible and visible. And that is um, extremely visual in nature. And if for the audience who might not know which, which picture Anita was talking about, this is a picture that um, came out and went viral at the very beginning of the protest of um, an Iranian girl removing her hijab, putting it on a stick, on fire, standing on a car um, with people um, clapping for her and cheering her for her, her bravery. Um, so I think this makes it extremely important to um, cover these events with some powerful and strong visuals that we have available online, online right now. Thank you so much to all three of you. Uh, if it's all right, I'd like to come back to Tara uh, to ask you for, as we unpack um, some of the tension, right, between uh, the desire for visibility, for representation, for media attention, and also some of the ways that that might lead to inaccuracies spreading. Um, the question is, what are your thoughts on the news coverage that you've seen so far, particularly coming out of US news outlets? Uh, are there things that you notice are, are commonly being incorrectly reported or distorted, um, especially as we think about journalists who are watching this, um, things that they should keep in mind? How much time do we have? <laughs> that's, a long, that's a long conversation. Um, that, let me start by this. I actually, um, in the course that I'm teaching, I, I had a session on journalism versus activism, right? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a classically trained journalist. I'm not a political activist. However, the stories that I do um, are shedding light on an issue, right, that might be calling for change, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to get into the differences between journalism and activism and, you know, and, and sort of dwell on that. However, um, coming back to your question about people's desire on what to see on the news, here's the thing. Um, I, you know, as a journalist, chose to deliberately write opinion pieces, okay, in the aftermath of uh, Massa's uh, killing, but that was a deliberate choice. Had I been working with, uh, you know, the networks that I've been working in the past, whether it be CNN, Al Jazeera, I would have not been doing that. However, I would be sticking to the news reporting and the and the news storytelling, right, which might not be what political activists, what millions of people in Iran who want immediate change to see, right? That's the, that's that. There's a distinction in opinion writing, in in activism, in advocacy work versus, you know, hard news reporting. And, and I'm sure, you know, you speak with your students about that and the students watching would know the difference. However, 
when it comes to coverage, whether it's the coverage on Iraq, whether that, that we've seen in the last, you know, 20, 25 years, whether it's this, the, the coverage of, of the, you know, early years of the Syrian conflict, what was unfolding in Syria, American news networks um, have a tendency of, again, it's, it's in many cases, lazy work of going to, you know, their usual suspects, you know, the talking heads, the policy people, you know, the think tank folks that they know, um, or, you know, the, the louder, uh, and 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 uh, you know bolder voices in the advocacy space that may not necessarily have the legitimacy um, that they should on the ground, right? And so uh, these are the regular suspects. These are the usual suspects that sort of take take over the media sphere. And again, we we see it in in all the big stories, whether it was Iraq, Syria, you know, Afghanistan, and now Iran. Um, that the pattern of how networks choose guests. Is, is in many ways similar. Now, as a journalist, I, I think there's nothing more powerful than to focus on human voices inside the field, inside the country, um, or, or the community that you're covering. And I understand that, you know, a correspondent sitting in, you know, the offices here in, in DC or, uh, you know, New York, they might not have access to that, but there are ways to not do lazy work and to get access, to find voices, to, to I mean, you, you, to vet through social media, to find um, to find real accounts of what's going on on the ground. Now, I use, I, I just said social media. That then poses the risk of an abundance of information out of which so much of it would, can be false. And, you know, in, in the images that we've seen out of, uh, you know, or presumably coming out of Iran, so many false images belonging, you know, to protests of the last couple of years, even at times, you know, different, different parts of the world. Uh, you know, we've seen those. So, Coming back to you know the part that you mentioned, the public's desire, the public needs to understand that, especially the diaspora, needs to understand that everything that's on social media, CNN and Al Jazeera and ABC and BBC and NBC can't post on on the network. Everything has to go through layers and layers and layers of editing. Even an opinion piece that I write for Time Magazine has to be edited you know, by five layers of editors. So it's not just, you know, you, you want to put out something and you put it out. Um, and, and also, again, I have to say, um, in the earlier days, there was criticism of network news uh, in the United States not covering the Iran story. But I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I disagree with that. Uh, the, the, the news has been covered, again, not in a sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage that perhaps an Iranian-American Who's so concerned, naturally so, rightfully so, would want to see. But that's just not the nature of news coverage. I mean, there's so many things going on around the world um, that, you know, news editors and news teams choose to, um, you know, uh, design and, and, and work their rundown based on, you know, what takes precedence. Uh, but, but I would say, um, you know, in the first few weeks, even, you know, now, um, if you you know, make, make a point to listen to CNN, BBC, uh, NPR, Al Jazeera, you would hear of Iran. Uh, if not on live coverage, the, the news hours, you would see on, on the dot com. And the same goes for um, all the papers. So there's a difference between journalism and activism, uh, mainstream, credible news outlets. Um, in, in the United States is vet things. Not everything that's on social can be posted, you know, on the front page of New York Times. And, um, and, and again, I call for a more um, accurate and uh, humanized, nuanced uh, presence when um, uh, Western new American news organizations want to talk about these issues on their coverage. Thank you so much. And related to some of what you've raised, and as I promised everyone, this is only the beginning of a much longer conversation, uh, but related to some of that, I wonder, Sarah, if you could speak a little more to what you were raising about the, um, the hijab removal, the haircutting, kind of social media videos, um, and some of those were being picked up, right, by news outlets as well. Um, but in your first remarks, you had mentioned that there could be some, some downsides to that kind of approach. Um, I wonder if you could say a little more about that. 
Sure. And, um, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm still gathering information about every single day. Um, so I just want to preface with that. Um, one of the things that I've come across just from several different um, people who are, whether they're part of the diaspora or if they're in the country, one thing I have noticed that's been pretty consistent across all of those outlets, regardless of the different ideological stances that come with this, is that you cannot be faulted for amplifying the voices of Iranians. And where performativity has been, uh, where there's been lots of accusations of performativity in the case of like Black Lives Matter, for instance, and the black square on Instagram and what what does that really do? And um, and, and, and to some extent, uh, even solidarity, um, posts with Palestine, it's been different with Iran. And I think it's because people don't, it's like, like Tara has said, um, people don't really know anything about Iran outside of what they've seen from Argo, you know, and, or whatever they've heard um, from the Trump administration pulling out of the nuclear deal. Like there's a bit, the narrative, the narratives are very limited. Um, so as far as these, um, I guess what makes me nervous, what makes me nervous is, and this is coming from out of a journalism school and, and speaking to what Tata was saying about um, classical journalism training, I think that there is, I do take issue with, with that because there isn't a lot of nuance there. And we do look at a lot of these stories in binaries. We look at it as, oh, hijab, anti-hijab, hair, not covering hair. And, um, you know, earlier we were having a conversation um, before uh, we officially started about are there hijabis out there who are showing support for women who aren't, um, who, who are uh, protesting against compulsory hijab. Now, back in 2017, when we looked at what was happening with White Wednesdays, there wasn't a ton of that. But now we are seeing more, uh, more of that where I'm seeing, I, at least I am, I'm seeing a lot of images where you have women um, with hijab or with a full veiling with full burqa holding the hand of a woman without, um, holding a hand of the, with the woman who's cutting her hair at the same time. They're really powerful images, which I'm sure Afruz can um, speak, speak to uh, better than I can. But again, I, I, the, what I feel nervous about is that I have students who are like, well, how do we show support? What does it look like to show support? Where can we give money? Where can we show military support? Because that's how a lot of Americans are used to showing support or like having to feel like they physically have to do something. They physically have to do something. And as because amplifying voices doesn't always seem like enough. And that's, and I, I'm not saying that cutting your hair and sending it to um, the embassy of your country is, is a bad idea. Obviously, that's not a bad idea. And again, if it's, it's, if it's pointing to the issue, I don't see, I don't see what the issue is. But it's those issues, it's the conversations that happen outside of those videos that concerns me. Because I have seen so many people be persecuted and um, hate crimes because of what they're, because of mixed messaging from what they see in protests against compulsory hijab. And that gets into like transnational feminism and this understanding that feminism can only look one certain way. Um, and that again, thinking in those binaries. And that's why I did say some, I, that's why I made the comment about this being about bo women's uh, bodily autonomy for women. Because when I said that um, to a group of students when we were talking, because I, I also teach about journalism and advocacy, it like they're like oh really so it's not about hijab because there that there is some mixed messaging about it and again like Tara also said you can't conflate everything that's happening in Iran to this one thing that happened with Masa obviously it that's it, it this is much bigger than that but again I'm thinking about what happens outside of these news narratives and that that's what gives me pause about some of these things that are circulating and how that is going to affect not just people in Iran, but Iranians within the United States as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Bruce, I feel like that's such an organic transition to ask you about any kinds of congruency or incongruency, as you described it, that you're seeing between the visual imagery that might be getting a lot of popularity 
could be through news coverage, could also be on social media or both. Um, and the ground realities uh, for folks who are, are living this right now. Um, sure. Uh, I think I uh, it's a better thing to start with the general um, term of framing here and then go to more specifically into the congruency issue. Um, I studied process in 2019 and how it was covered by um, the Western um, news outlets. And we, without any rigorous analysis and systematic analysis, I can tell that it already is different um, from what we had in 2019, um, both in terms of a number of articles and number of programs um, that are being dedicated to the issue of Iran, and also in terms of uh, the visuals that they use to cover these events. Um, so this is good, I'm happy about that. But at the same time, I think the issue of framing is something that is extremely important um, as we all know, we cannot talk about every single thing. We need to summarize. We need to uh, make some aspects of an even more salient, com salient compared to other aspects. But I think it needs to be done uh, with an extreme amount of cautious. Um, so I start with um, um, just one example, it was a, a news article published by the New York Times, and I pay a lot of attention to New York Times because, um, to your surprise, Iranians do not like New York Times. Um, they believe that um, in the past years, it has misrepresented the reality of their lives. Um, so I'm just being extra cautious and extra curious about New York Times in general. Um, so I saw an article um, labeled with, with the headline, Out of Reach, Dreams in a Sickly Economy Provoke the Rage in Iran. Um, and the entire article goes about the economy in Iran and how sanctions has uh, have made economy in Iran even worse. And that people want sanctions to be lifted and that people um, see many Iranians, this is code and code, many Iranians believe that, um, with a nuclear deal with, with the US, many of our problems will be solved. Um, there is no single image of the protest in this entire article. It's all about people on the streets doing some sort of shopping. Um, and this is, this is one of the articles that made people extremely angry. It was published at the same time where school girls, teenagers, um, again, those who have to go through mandatory hijab, there is no way of not wearing a scarf at the school. They're removing their scarves. They're uh, writing woman life freedom on the blackboards of their um, classroom with their long, beautiful hair um, and taking pictures hand in hand. Um, they were insulting the Supreme Leader and the founder of the Islamic Revolution. There were videos of them kicking out um, and booing and um, education official who came to their school to educate them. And um, these pictures showed that the, the, these protests are not about one single thing. It's about freedom in general and sanctions or economic hardship is a part of it, but it's not the most important part of it. Um, so we should also pay attention to this fact that um, we are we are producing English news for mainly non-Iranian um, audiences. They, first of all, don't care about a lot of things that are happening in different places if they're not already familiar with that or if they don't have friends or family out there. Um, if we want to get their attention, probably we can only do that by making them read one single article. I agree that there are a lot of articles being published, let's say, by um, the New York Times, all of them are focusing on different aspects of these protests, but we cannot um, just expect those non-Iranian, non-interested audiences to read all these articles. We need to be able to talk about the most important things in, in, in only one article. So dedicating an entire article to sanctions, which is something that has not been even talked about once in the videos that are online available. People are not saying death to the US. People are not saying that lift the sanctions. People are saying that death, death to the dictator. They're saying woman life freedom. Um, so we already can say that already um, people have understood that the problem is the regime itself. If they get rid of the regime, many other issues, including sanctions, including economic hardship would go away on itself. Um, 
And also um, maybe switching to another article by the New York Times, which was a very nice one. Um, it was actually a, an investigative video report by um, an invest a video re uh, reporter, uh, which was perfectly covering everything, all aspects of these protests. But again, it has one, one um, tiny issue, and that is it starts with um, just a um, a section um, labeled attacking symbols of um, the state, which is true. People aren't mad at the ideology, so they are burning ideological symbols in the city. They're burning the statues of Khomeini and Khomeini. They are burning banners of any um, ideological thing, and they're showing their um, anger uh, by doing so. But again, for a non-Iranian audience, not familiar with the context, showing these images of attacking something, putting something on fire is not okay. They, the first thing they think about is that, oh, this is chaos, this is chaotic. There is some disorder in the city and I think that it's okay for the police to control them because they're destroying things. They're um, vandalizing. Um, and then it goes until toward the end of the article, it talks about hijab, it talks about uh, women's bodily autonomy and things like that. But we should not forget that people are not spending that much of time on online news. They probably spend a few seconds or um, being more optimistic if you want to two minutes on each article. And then by the time that you get to the main point of these protests, which is just, um, more importantly, women in general, um, we have already lost the audience. They're not even reading that part. So that is in line with the protest paradigm, which argues that protests in general are being um, shown as some the legitimate act that um, the police, that is deserved by the police to be oppressed and to be stopped because that um, creates disorder, which is not the case um, in the case of Iran protests that we're talking about here. Thank you so much. And we are quickly approaching time for audience questions. So for those of you in the audience, you should have access to the chat. And after this next question, I will open it up. So please um, feel free to share your questions in just a moment. My last question, and I would love to start with Tara on this, is thinking about what you raised about the need for nuance, the need to move away from kind of lazy, obvious notions of quoting a defense secretary uh, instead of anyone else. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little more for folks who are in the audience and trying to do this kind of reporting, how they can get started when they maybe have not covered any issue like this before. As you mentioned, they may not have existing sourcing networks. Um, and of course, there's a lot of concern about amplifying the wrong sorts of pieces of a very large picture. Um, how would you suggest they go about doing this? Well, first of all, for someone who's never covered Iran or the Middle East, I don't think it's right for any newsroom to put them on assignment to be covering what's going on in Iran. So if anyone gives you an assignment to cover Iran and your beat was always Latin America, just say you can't do it. Um, so that's that. But if you are a student wanting to get started on covering Iran or the Middle East, um, read, 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 read. That's what I tell my students. Read credible news organizations, even though even articles that you don't agree with. Um, Afruz mentioned the New York Times article. Um, I can't remember line by line of what that article uh, said. You know, I, I really can't because I think it was early October that the piece came out. So I can't really speak to the line by line. Uh, but 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 outlets such as the New York Times, the Financial Times, Washington Post. Um, they, the way they work is they would assign different reporters to cover different angles and aspects of that story, the same way that CNN, for example, um, would, would assign different reporters to cover different angles of that issue, right? Um, so, um, so that's just what I want to leave that with because I don't want to dwell on 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 that article on that or on that story. And I want to answer your question, but for the students who are uh, sort of getting trained in becoming better reporters, um, I don't think there's anything more valuable than again doing groundwork reporting, familiarizing yourself with the nuances, 
and the isms that go on in a country, um, you know, again, the issue of sanctions, I, I don't want to go back to that, but I remember I was leading the coverage for Al Jazeera America in Iran back in 2015, where the two, you know, where Iran and P5 plus one were signing uh, what became known as JCPOA. And the mood on the street was, was um, so joyous and so excited, not because the people were in support of the government. No, let's be very clear here. The people who are protesting today are the same people that seven years ago were excited for, for a possibility of a deal, not because they, their opinion of their regime was different or because they, they wanted their regime to stay, but because they thought their livelihoods would change. They thought for a moment that they can have an easier time making ends meet. They thought that they can have an opportunity to, to engage with the rest of the world. And I think understanding you know, the, the sort of gray area between the black and white is so important uh, for us to cover any country, any part of the world. And, um, and in order for us to understand, for instance, what's going on in Iran, we need to understand um, the, the many layers of challenges that women have had in the society for the past 40 years, both in private, in public. Um, but we also have to understand the strides they've made. You know, the, the, how did they overcome the many challenges that they have? Iran, as I've written, has some of the most educated female uh, populations in the region. 60% of uh, college graduates are women. But then again, that doesn't undermine the fact that uh, there is a tremendous lack of job opportunities for both women and men. So again, nothing is black and white, but rather uh, there, there's tremendous amount of gray area when covering places like Iran. And so for students and folks who are interested in pursuing careers in journalism, um, they need to know these gray areas. They need to understand uh, that they they don't know the entirety of the picture, and there's no better way to understand um, or educate themselves than being in the field on the ground from the people whose lives are being affected by these issues. Not dissidents, not not people who you know who've been out of the country for the last 50 years, not you know think tankers and so on. A good reporter is in the field. Um, and at the very least understands, you know, uh, the many cultural uh, sensitivities and so on. Obviously, I don't expect all the reporters covering Iran uh, be fully bilingual. Uh, but again, I'm sorry, you know, you can't cover a region or a country without uh, being able to communicate with its people. So having a strong understanding of the language, cultural nuances um, is, is incredibly important. Um, and so, for students wanting to get into international reporting, um, go out there. You can't be a good reporter sitting in, in your office or your your apartment in, in, in the United States. Oh, by the way, I'm not telling anyone to go to Iran. Please uh, don't misconstrue what I'm trying to say. I <laughs> hope. For sure. Thank you so much for that, Tara. I think this is crucial, right? The logic of, of needing to push into uh, to getting to that ground truth uh, and not settling for press releases or people who claim to know who are not of the people affected. Uh, I am so torn at this moment. I want to make sure we have time for our excellent audience question. So instead of, of kicking this question to Sarah and Afruz, I'm going to jump to audience questions because um, I think these are both good ones. We have a question from uh, Ornaz saying, thank you for organizing this event. I have a question for Afruz. I am intrigued by the performative and visual orientation uh, as we think about the framing of this revolution. How would you say woman life freedom is different potentially from previous social movements and what might make this a feminist revolution? Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that. There's more to the question, but let me start at that point. Um, sure, thank you for the question. Um, just let me make sure that I'm getting it right. Sure. Um, so I think it's different from previous social movements, first of all, because it was sparked with um, the death of, um, the killing actually of um, a woman who was just living her ordinary life by visiting the capital of Iran. Uh, from her own small town and then all of a sudden was approached by um, 
the hijab police, probably it's a better um, translation because they care about your appearance, not your morals, um, and then died. And then um, again, it, um, it has intersections with all other minorities in Iran, including ethnic minorities. Um, so people, um, women are at the forefront of these protests. We see that women are extremely brave and at the same time they are being supported and protected by their men around them. We see a lot of videos that women are, are standing there in front of the, um, the riot police or whoever, and then they're, 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 they're removing their hijab. It's illegal. For just that single act, you, you, will, you can get detained and you can get killed as we saw here, but they are doing that fearlessly. Um, so um, I think the fact that it has been able to just uh, make all women in Iran united, regardless of their um, demographic background and everything, uh, makes it a feminist movement at the, at the very first place. Um, and let me see the second part of the question. Um, so I think the question is here that bodily autonomy cannot be inclusive enough to represent the entire revolution, uh, which I cannot say that I entirely agree with. And the reason is that um, bodily autonomy um, is, first of all, it's not only for, for women. Um, men are also not allowed to do a lot of things. For example, we have had some instances of um, laws and regulations where men could not wear a t-shirt or like um, tight t-shirts. They, they had to have more loose clothes on. Um, and also it has to do with the ability of holding the hand of your loved one on the street. Um, if you are seen with um, a woman, if you're a man and you're seen by a woman on the street, there is, chances are high that you're approached by the police asking about your relationship. So it's not only about women, it affects all aspects of life of everyone living in Iran. Um, and I think um, thinking about women as the largest commu uh, minority community in Iran, um, and then how it gets connected to other minorities, other smaller mi minorities, including ethnicities, again, makes it a very strong thing um, that enables us to say that this is a feminine, a, a feminist re um, revolu revolution. Um, but I guess Sara, given her background, um, is able to elaborate more on that part of um, this question. Yeah, please. Um, Pranaz, thank you for the question. And uh, I'm just going to read what she wrote. I, I think that we misread her, her comment. She, she believes that it can, uh, that bodily autonomy for women can um, represent the entirety of the revolution. Um, and I, I think it was just worded. Um, it was just hard to word. Uh, what I would say to that is kind of like when people, when, when I looked at solidarity campaigns between um, uh, Black Americans and Palestinians in Palestine, um, and even going as far back to like the civil rights era is that uh, not, we, we can't be free until all people are free, right? And so I think that that's how I'm thinking of the revolution is again, if we're talking about a woman being this the symbol for the state, whether it's we're talking about the um, the Islamic Republic using hijab as a way to control women or to control society, um, again, it's not about the hijab per se. It's about relations of power here. So using this idea as the body of the woman as the symbol of the state, that's what I mean when I say if there's bodily autonomy for women, that is what is representative of the revolution. And I, I probably, I might not have been super clear about that. And that just goes into, again, like with these um, understandings of the motherland and the image of the woman with, uh, like with France, for instance, um, there's a lot of different laws about um, um, 
controlling women and how how they wear hijab or they can't wear hijab or depending on the region again it's because they want to present this image that they're a secular nation and they're using the body of the woman to make that make that point um so in that way i would say that encompasses freedom for the country it, it that's how that's how i would view it Thank you for those responses. I'm going to jump to our final question and we'll start with Tara for addressing this. This is a question from Saeed who asks, how would you as journalists hold news agencies and journalists uh, who are writing inaccurate or biased articles accountable? How might we as citizens on the reading side uh, take some steps to avoid recurrence of heavily biased articles going viral. Um, so I think this is related to a theme we were touching on earlier that of course uh, visibility is important, but are there things we can do to make sure that visibility is in service of accuracy as opposed to just any headline that catches our eye? Thanks so much, Anita, for that question. By the way, um, I don't know if Anita, if you want to share my uh, last op-ed um, for Time Magazine, which actually is in the print article. Oh print, yes, um, that was in the chat. I'm happy to share it again for sure. Uh, speaks to the whole, you know, women movement, and one of the, um, uh, you know, I, I I I've written this in different ways because there's only. Uh, there's only a few times that I can repeat myself in, in each piece saying the same thing, but um, I think for the readers who are interested in this in this issue of you know bodily autonomy and the hijab and and you know that that angle of this you know conversation, I think it's you know the way I would sum this up is that you know in Iran, a country of 83 million, there are millions of Iranian women who believe in the virtue of their hijab and they want to wear it but they absolutely detest and resent the government's force feeding and shoving their ideology that is nothing at all uh, close to what they believe in their heart. And then in tandem, there are millions of uh, women, young and old, who resent uh, wearing this hijab, who, who, who don't believe in it, but they long uh, wait for the day that it can be their choice. So, so it, is, it is about their choice and, and uh, people's critique and resentment of a system of a theocracy that shoves their version of ideology in their lives um, in, in all aspects of livelihood. Um, and so um, I leave that to, I leave this to that and, and I hope I can add some more insight on this um, in, in the piece I wrote. But as far as journalism, listen, uh, first of all, um, I want, I want um, and students would, would would learn this as they go, but but uh, some of our viewers who are not necessarily journalists or studying journalism, um, I think it's important to understand that every single story that comes out, whether it be on you know the CNNs of this world or New York Times or Washington Post, again, it's not the result of one person's reporting or one person's writing, and that's it. Every story goes through layers and layers of vetting and editorial oversight, fact checking, right? And so if a viewer or if an audience sees something that they don't necessarily agree with or they like, that doesn't, that doesn't immediately um, equate or mean that that story or that reporting is false or factually incorrect. Does that make sense? If you as a reader don't agree with this report or don't like to see it done that in that way, it doesn't mean that the story inherently is factually incorrect, all right? However, if there are factual errors in a piece, there are often times that, you know, the journalist or the editorial team will go back and correct it. And, you know, um, Iranians have been doing a good job and going viral on, you know, uh, showing their resentment towards uh, certain things. Some um, valid and some, quite frankly, not valid. Uh, but I think um, that's one of the beauties of freedom of speech. Um, you know, as 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 uh, people in the diaspora are filled with emotion toward their homeland and what's going on, it's only natural for them to want the news outlets to cover certain issues a certain way or the way that they want those stories to be covered. But at the same time, and I think that goes back to the issue of activism versus journalism. You know, um, the idea that some people may expect journalists and reporters to lead and, and you know, push out articles that essentially, um, you know, call for 
uh, regime change as, as, as sort of a reporter is very different than if an activist or an opinion writer writes that. I just want to be very clear here, right? Um, because then that way the New York Times or whatever, Washington Post um, or The Guardian would be then accused that, oh, uh, such and such news outlets orchestrating a coup d'etat, you know, uh, calling for the overthrow of whatever regime, right? Does that make sense? And so um, that's, again, the difference between journalism and news reporting versus um, pieces that are written by activists and you know advocates on a topic but but again if um, audiences find factual errors in a piece um, there are always ways to reach out to the editorial team um, or the reporter who has reported the piece and pretty much you know professional news outlets are good at um, redacting and, and uh, correcting uh, the, the factual errors. But just because someone doesn't you know, like an article, it doesn't mean that it's factually incorrect. Thank you for that, Tara. Let us end where we began with Sarah. I wonder if you could weigh in on this question of coping with uh, this impulse to reshare, but also needing to find ways to, uh, to stop the spread, as some say, of misinformation that could come up through that too. Sure. Uh, well, first and foremost, read the article before you reshare it. Um, I will, I will okay. and, and I mean, guilty, I've definitely done it. And I know like Twitter has like a prompt now that says, have you read this article before uh, you retweet it? So definitely read the article before you retweet it, even if it's someone that you normally do agree with in their coverage, um, because I've actually switched around people that I'm like, oh, okay, I, I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that that's how that was going to go. And there are and there are obviously some news articles that are categorized as news that hold bias. And I mean, we, I've talked to my students about this all the time. Objectivity and bias to some extent is, is mythical, but um, or at least something to aspire to. But um, I do want to give props to Afruz on this because she she posted something on Twitter about the uh, protest paradigm. And I've really been mulling over that a lot. And so I think it's important for people who are either covering the protests or um, or reading about the protests that they pay attention to the sourcing. Um, number one thing that I always say is to look at the look at the sources. Who are the voices? Um, in the same way that I would say about any protest, I, I think about when even like the Black Lives Matter protests, like who, where is the information coming from? Are we still teaching um, journalism students to get all their information about a shooting from a police report? You know, there needs to be more of that. And I did a lot of um, research on what I look on uh, the 2017 protests, the White Wednesdays protests in Iran. And I've already seen a huge jump in um, the way that things have been sourced in a good way. I'm seeing a lot more voices that are on the ground in a way that I didn't see in 2017. Um, and so I would say uh, one of the things that in the article I, I uh, posted by Danny Brown and Summer Harlow, um, who are two phenomenal media scholars that I definitely think you should follow on Twitter, um, they write in in, resp in response to the George Floyd protest to find black activists, advocates, community members and leaders in the community and give them a voice in your coverage. And I would say the same in this particular case. And obviously to to use wisdom and with that. And like Tara said, um, vetting through social media and putting in the work because it's work. It's work to, to read it and it's work to write it. Thank you so much for that and for those great references. Uh, I have just dropped a bunch of things in the chat. We are regrettably at time. Uh, please join me in thanking all three of our panelists for their time, insight, and care in showing up and sharing so much with us today. Uh, I do sincerely hope this is not the last time we all encounter each other. Uh, there's a link to mediaengagement.org slash solidarity journalism. And I'm dropping my uh, email address in the chat. Please feel free to be in touch uh, if you have been as inspired as I have by this conversation. Uh, let's continue to talk. Thank you all again. Be well.